Hello and welcome back to Capitol Hill Ocean Talk on OceansLive.org. I am your host, Kate Thompson, with NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries, coming to you live from the museum in Washington, D.C., on the final day of Capitol Hill Ocean Week 2014. Throughout the week, we've brought you behind-the-scenes conversations with some of the most influential ocean leaders here at Chow. Send us your questions, and I know some of you will have questions for today's guests, through the Oceans Live chat. Before we kick off our discussion about the future of our ocean health today, I want to acknowledge our sponsors, Mystic Aquarium and the Sea Research Foundation. Hello to everyone watching our broadcast at Mystic Aquarium today. And now I'm thrilled to welcome Fabian Cousteau via live link from the Aquarius Reef Bay 60 feet below the surface of Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary. Fabian is a champion of ocean exploration and conservation and a returning guest here on Oceans Live. He is currently 12 days into Mission 31, his attempt to break the record set by his grandfather Jacques Cousteau by living underwater for 31 days. Also joining Fabian in the Aquarius today is Dr. Joe Pollack from the University of North Carolina Wilmington Center for Marine Science, who has been conducting long-term monitoring near Aquarius for about two decades. Here in the studio, we have Dr. Sebastian Troying. Sebastian is Conservation International's Senior Vice President for Science and Oceans, overseeing a team of 80 staff that represent Conservation International's global science and ocean capacity. Last, but certainly not least, is Barton Seaver, a chef and conservationist who has dedicated his career to restoring the relationship we have with our ocean. Seaver has manned the helm of some of Washington, D.C.'s most acclaimed restaurants, bringing the idea of sustainable seafood to the nation's capital. He now serves as the Director of Healthy and Sustainable Food Program at Harvard School of Public Health. Gentlemen, thank you so much for, for joining us here on Capitol Hill Ocean Talk. And Fabian and Joe, thanks so much for joining us from the bottom of the ocean. So exciting to see pleasure. you. <laughs> Fabian, I'm so used to you being in the studio with me. <laughs> well, it's a good thing uh, that everyone focuses on the fact that this is a very great thing. Um, actually, the beauty of this is that we're able to connect with you live from the bottom of the sea. That's the most important thing, the outreach, science, and education. It's, it's so very cool. So you're trying to break your, your grandfather's record of 30 days. Uh, how is this wonderful mission going? Are you tired? Do you want to come back up yet? <laughs> you know, I've always felt more comfortable in the ocean than I did on land. And this to me is paradise. And Aquarius has been home for now 12 days. I look very much forward to the remainder of Mission 31. As a matter of fact, I realized I think we all have that we need many, many more months down here just to study the, the regional area, much less the rest of the oceans that haven't been explored. Uh, the, the extra day uh, longer than my grandfather did is really more an homage to all those aquanauts past and, of course, to the future generations to come so that we may be able to explore our oceans uh, deeper, longer, and further than we ever have. Well, so not many people ever get to live on the bottom of the ocean like yourself. Uh, I've actually done it myself for nine days, and I think you're amazingly crazy staying longer than that. <laughs> so uh, for people who never get to go to the depths of the ocean, why should they care about these places? Because quite simply, we've heard this throughout Capitol Hill Ocean Week and, of course, many other venues, that without a healthy ocean, there's no such thing as healthy people. And the fact that... Uh, by and large, people are completely disconnected with what's going on in our oceans uh, is a, a alarming to the ones that you know, because what's happening right now to our oceans uh, are, uh, are things of dire consequence that really uh, dictate our economy and our very own health. This is our life support system. We need to know more about it, and we need to make better decisions in our everyday lives and, of course, in government. So what is it about Aquarius and getting to watch you live underwater all day and all night <laughs> that helps make the connection between regular people and the underwater world? Well, for the first time in the expedition, we're able to connect live with viewers around the world, whether it's through the live camera, as you pointed out, on our website, mission-31.com, or whether it's on social media such as Skype in the classroom, where we can reach out to children in China or in the U.S. or in South America, anywhere on this planet, uh, as well as adults or the ones that are young at heart. Uh, 
so that we're able to show how beautiful this place is and how much this uh, means to us as human beings. Um, we're doing some very real uh, science and coral uh, studies around climate change and pollutants around coral reefs. And Joe here is an expert uh, around Aquarius and the studies because he's been doing this for 20 years since Aquarius first got here. So, Dr. Pollock, thank you so much for joining us and diving down and being, and being with Fabian today. We're, we're excited to talk to you a little bit about your, your scientific research and how important it is to, to the, the ocean health. Um, can, can you tell me, since you've been doing this for 20-some years, what, what's been the change down there? Uh, I mean, even in my difference of diving at the beginning of the 90s to uh, when I saturated in 2007, there was so much difference already in the coral reefs. Can you tell me, in 20 years, what are you seeing different then versus now? Well, uh, unfortunately, as you know, the corals have done poorly, but the sponges are doing great. And uh, they're colorful, they're biodiverse, there are lots of species of them, and uh, they're taking over some of the real estate that the corals left behind. And uh, fortunately, sponges are good for the ecology of the reef. They filter the water and make it clear. Uh, they, they remove nutrients, which is good for potentially bringing corals back. Of course, what we don't know is whether they're also inhibiting the recruitment of new corals. Um, we're, those are the kinds of questions that we're trying to find out. And those are the kinds of questions that can only be found out in a facility like Aquarius. Something right. I noticed here also is that the biodiversity seems to be much richer, denser than in places that are not protected. And just the first itself has become a living reef. Oh, no question. You see more fish, you see more invertebrates. The, the biodiversity is hugely enhanced because this has been a special protected area for over 20 years now. And so there hasn't been the harvesting, there hasn't been fishing. And, and the fish here are huge, and their effects in the ecosystem uh, result in a greater level of biodiversity. Well, so much uh, research is done in and around that 60 feet area right there at the habitat, uh, but so much of the ocean is so unexplored. I mean, we don't, we don't even get to go to the depths of the ocean and really know what's there. There's only a few people that have ever gone to the, the very deep parts of the ocean. Who knows what discoveries or medical break, breakthroughs we could find? So why is it so important to keep exploring? Well, are you asking uh, as a scientist or as an explorer? I want both of you to answer that question. <laughs> well, as an explorer, uh, I'll quote my grandfather since it was his birthday yesterday, and he inspired hundreds of millions around the world for over 50 years, and myself <laughs> included. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is really after this. And he used to say that if one person, for whatever reason, has a chance to lead an extraordinary life, he or she has no right to keep it for themselves. As an explorer, when you get to be part and blessed with uh, a fireworks display of life, of mystery, and, of course, a reflection on the potential future of our very own species, we absolutely must discuss these things. We must bring these things in uh, packages that the general public enjoys and, and devours so that we can hook them into the understanding of why this is such a special place for everybody, marine biologists, explorer, and the general public. And from my side, the, the technology that Fabian's grandfather pioneered allowed us as human beings for the first time to explore the undersea realm in much the same way that terrestrial ecologists or even any person who has a backyard garden is able to go up and watch their rose bushes grow or watch deer or anything that you would do in a terrestrial environment to do that in, a, in the marine realm. Before that time, none of that sort of thing took place. Aquarius allows us to do it for a much longer period of time. You can go diving for nine hours uh, out of the day, something that you cannot do uh, using just conventional surface time. And that's the, the transformational uh, ability that, that looks like a court of well, one of our FIU students who is here with us, we're actually out on the reef now, thankfully, uh, they uh, were just saying that they can do six months of research and data collection in just two weeks. So during missions 
day one, they will have done basically a year worth of research and data collecting in just one month. Wow, that, that's so impressive. So Fabian, you just mentioned that your grandfather's birthday was yesterday. Uh, in, in honor of, of the great Jacques Cousteau, we here in the studio, we have our uh, red hats, okay? Uh, yep, <clears throat> his uh, red watch cap, right? So uh, in honor of that, that gentleman, I think even when we saturated that one time, we were diving in our red caps. Ah, they've got their red caps, yay! <laughs> we worked them all day yesterday. Woo! I want to be down there instead of and, here. <laughs> Dan, for us and, and all of you for providing us with these wonderful caps. It's, it's a huge tribute and honor, and, and I can't thank you all enough. I saw some pictures from yesterday, and I you know after my grandfather. I salute you all. Uh, just uh, amazing. Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. You bet. Yeah. So uh, have a, a wonderful time in the, in the rest of your mission. We're going to talk a little bit more about ocean health here in the studio. And I know you have lots of amazing things you have to get to, so, so we, won't, we won't keep you any longer. But thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pollock and to Fabian for Skyping in with us today. And good luck with the rest of your mission. And we'll be watching and staying tuned to all the great things that you've got going on down there. Big hugs from Benita Yay! Keep going first <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. So, uh, Sebastian, <laughs> I'm sure this is keeping them nice and warm down yeah. in the habitat yeah. in the 80 degree temperatures that they have down nice there. Nice and here, too. <laughs> so, uh, tell us about your role and how you became involved in ocean conservation. So, I grew up by a, a small ocean, the, the Baltic Sea, mm -hmm. and I used to spend my summers swimming in the not very warm water. Uh, fishing uh, and and you know really growing up by the sea and uh, I could see as I grew up how fisheries became depleted. Uh, my neighbor was a, a fisherman and it was more and more difficult to to catch food. The local plant that was packing seafood uh, closed down, and so I, I became concerned about ocean issues and and uh, really pursued a career in in ocean science and conservation uh, in different parts around the world. And now I have the privilege of leading up. Uh, Conservation International's global uh, science and oceans team uh, to see how we can be helpful in, in recovering ocean health. Well, Dr. Pollock was just saying how he had been monitoring the ocean for 20 years and had seen so many different changes throughout the years. Can you tell us how you can measure ocean health? So that's a great question. And, and a couple of years ago, uh, actually one of our board members, William Wrigley, asked us that same question. We said, well, you know, there are lots of different ways you can do it. And he said, no, but is there one measure of ocean health? And so he said, well, that's a good question. So we actually did a search of the literature and, and realized that there wasn't one consolidated measure. And so we set out on an effort, uh, together with a number of partners who were interested in the same issue, to develop an index for ocean health. And that became the Ocean Health Index. Uh, it's a collaboration involving about 65 scientists. Uh, it's brought together partners like the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis at the University of California at Santa Barbara. National Geographic, Conservation International, New England Aquarium, University of British Columbia, uh, to come up with a measure of ocean health. And, and one thing which I think uh, it does that's different is that it defines ocean health as, or a healthy ocean as one that provides a range of benefits to people now and in the future. So it doesn't see, see people as something separate for oceans, but something that's part of it. Um, and that makes it, uh, I believe, more inclusive and, and a useful tool for people to come together and really discuss how we can best uh, put in place solutions that recover ocean health. So I've seen this ocean index and it seems that uh, it kind of is a little scary considering, you know, I live in the U.S. and it, it puts us up against other countries to say, wow, <laughs> U.S., you're only in the 60s. And that's that to me is like... Really? The 60s? That's how bad the U.S. is doing? Because if you think about scores in school, 60s, not very great. So can you tell us what, what is 60? What, is that, what does that mean? And I know we have a, a graphic here for the U.S. And can, if you can explain the graphic sure. of the index and, and what it means. So the, the index basically measure how well countries' oceans are delivering these different types of benefits. The ability to provide food to people, the, the ability to uh, protect the coasts, to provide coastal livelihoods and economies, 10 different goals. And so the best score you can have is 100. And the, the global average is 65. And as you pointed out, the US comes in roughly around the global average at 67. Uh, and there are uh, about 100 different global databases that we've pulled upon to do this. And so we tried to get an index where you can actually compare different countries uh, to get an idea of 
which countries do things really well, because mm -hmm. they might have solutions in place that we should try to replicate, mm -hmm. and also which countries are not doing so well, so we can see where we need to prioritize further work. And so if you look at the 220 countries and territories that we've assessed with this tool, uh, it varies from about 41 up to uh, I think 94, so a very wide range, and as you point out, the U.S. is in the middle. So there are things that can be improved in, in the so U.S. So what's the best country and what's the worst country? So the, the territory that scores the best are herd islands that belong to, to Australia, so fairly remote islands. Uh, and the country that scores the lowest is Guinea-Bissau uh, in, in West Africa, that comes in at, at 41. And the way that the score is constructed is that we look both at what the status is of the particular goal, so uh, what's the status, say, of wild capture fisheries. We then look at what the trend is, or has been over the last five years, because that's a good predictor of what is going to be in the, in the immediate future. And then we look at what pressures are in place that may influence things for the worse in the future. But also, and this is important, I think, for policy, what's the resilience measures in place? What are countries doing to try to improve ocean health that gives us hope for the future? And that makes it highly policy relevant because it allows policymakers to make decisions, get instant credit for that. And then, of course, as we see the underlying ecosystem improve, the score uh, will improve over time. Well, I think it's a great way to say, come on, countries, do a better job. And, and, and we've, we've had that reaction uh, in a number of different countries. They compare themselves to their neighbors and they say, hey, you know, <laughs> we're doing worse than they are. We're doing better than they are. And, and uh, uh, it's, it's been a very useful tool for engaging policymakers and really try to get a, a fact-based mm -hmm. debate around oceans and ocean health. Well, Barton, you have cook some of these amazing <laughs> fish that we've been talking about. Um, but I think in saying that, you're, you're, you're a forward-thinking chef and that sustainably, nice. sustainability is extremely important um, to, to get people to understand that you know, what they put on their plates and, and, and put into their mouths is they need to think about it bef before they do that. So what motivated you to take an interest in sustainable seafood? Uh, you know, it started when I was a child. I was born and raised here in Washington, D.C., a very rare breed. Uh, it's actually from this city, but I got to spend my summers down on the Patuxent River, a uh, tributary of the Chesapeake, and I would spend my entire day in the quest for food. And uh, early in the morning, I'd run down the pier and pull off the pilings, giant blue crabs, a carapace six and a half inches wide. Every third cast of my line came back with it, a perch, a porgy, a croaker, a striper, a blue, a ray. I mean, you name it. There was bounty in those waters. And that was my baseline. Uh, and that exploration of food became such a, a, a driver and an inspiration in my life that uh, it led me into professional kitchens. And when I had the first opportunity to write my own menu, I realized that a menu is, is very much a personal narrative. It's a story. How do I communicate my passions, my creativity to you, my, my guests? So I got on the phone. I said, hey, send me bluefish. I want striped bass. So I want oysters. Blue crab. Oh, my God. This is going to be fabulous. And the guy on the other end of the line said, kid, what are you talking about? We ate all those. What else do you want? And I realized right then that the, the guiding hand of natural selection is, is quite firmly holding a fork. And the way that we eat largely describes how this world is used. Uh, and we haven't been using it very well. But it also gave me a, a real sense of hope. That I realized that if chefs and the choices that we make as consumers, if we can near extirpate bluefin tuna, if we can uh, bring to the brink of eradication the, the orange roughy, if we can deplete ecosystems, that's great news. Because if we are the problem, we're the solution. And by those very same choices, we can begin to heal and restore that which we have depleted and made sick. And that has really led me to a very, a very positive outlook on sustainability, not looking at just how we impact ecosystems, but also taking measure of how we are impacted by them. Mm -hmm. You know, just as you measure uh, the health of the ecosystems, the health of the oceans, so too must we measure the health of the people that rely upon them. Because ultimately, when we talk about sustainability, our goal is to sustain our reality through resilient, thriving ecosystems. Well, how does a diner take that in? I mean, that's a, that's a mouthful in itself. How do, they, how do they understand that? How do you communicate that? How do you help them to understand that their choices and what they eat uh, could help the ocean itself? Well, I, I think we're, we're really coming around to an understanding that we can be no healthier than the foods that we eat. Uh, I think that that's pretty well founded in our canon of thought. 
And we're beginning to understand now that the foods we eat can be no healthier than the environments they come from. And this is largely due to the, the rise of organic agriculture and, and really a broad societal understanding that a healthy ecosystem provides healthy food. And so by simple mathematical principle, uh, if you know, A equals B and B equals C, then human beings can be no healthier than the environments that we live in. And so I think people are literally looking to healthy diets. Uh, people are looking to uh, smaller portions of healthy proteins. And most importantly, are looking to lots of vegetables, diverse diets. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also the, the great advantage that culinary itself, the, the art of entertainment that we get through the craft of cooking, people are really beginning to branch out look for different options. We're not just so stuck on cod, salmon, shrimp, and tuna anymore. People are looking to diversify their demand. And what that's doing is, is really uh, sort of redrafting the relationship, we, the economic relationship we have with our oceans uh, in, in creating an economy that's based on what the oceans can supply mm -hmm. rather than demanding of the oceans what we are only willing to eat. Well, I, I think that it seems the way you've been talking that people have sort of become receptive to this whole idea of sustainable seafoods and, and what we do. And with you, Sebastian, and you saying, look, this is where we are. This is our ocean index. If we don't make change, you, they're not going to be on our plates anymore. And I think that's when people finally stand up and take notice. What do you mean I can't get my orange roughy anymore or, or, or I can't get my Chilean sea bass anymore? That, I want that. So I think that's when they finally kind of say, all right, well, maybe, maybe we do need to start <laughs> making change and that you know, what I do in Nebraska does impact the ocean every day, regardless of the fact that I don't live in California. So um, that's what we're trying to do. And today we have a pin site, the Mystic Aquarium. And uh, aquariums across the country oftentimes are a window to people uh, through, through their entering those doors to see those beautiful fish in tanks. Uh, they can sometimes help us to, to bring out that conservation uh, word and to be able to say you need to do make do a better better job and make make change yourself with what you choose and what you put on put on your plate. Um, so I think this has been an amazing conversation in regards to ocean health and regards to ocean exploration. Um, do you all think that special places like National Marine Sanctuaries or marine protected areas? Do you think that they can help in this situation in ocean health? Sure. I mean, as, as you said, and as Bart mentioned, I think there is, you know, there's a direct, clearly a direct connection between ocean health and human well-being, um, even as far as you know, economic and national security. And so we need to look at all the tools that are available to us to secure ocean health. And, and marine sanctuaries, obviously, is, is one of those tools. Uh, it can help uh, depleted areas recover. It can help sensitive ecosystems uh, be in, in better shape populations uh, come back that might have been depleted. Uh, but I think we also need to recognize that they're, they're one tool in a broader toolbox, uh, and they're not going to solve everything for us. Mm -hmm. And we need to combine them with tools that allow us to put in place better fisheries management, better management of tourism, shipping, uh, pollution, uh, all the other uh, aspects that impact ocean health. And, and so we can't see them in isolation. We need to, to put them in a, in a context and, and apply all the different tools we have to make sure that oceans are healthy and can continue to deliver human well-being benefits and, and underpin our economic and national security. So Barton, how can you uh, work in your, in your capacity at Harvard and getting the word out there? Um, how can chefs across the nation, if you could bring them all together, what would you say to them? Uh, the first thing I would say is, is, is relating back to the earlier point, is diversify our demand. Uh, when, we have, when we have a system that, on, that so myopically uh, looks at the ocean, uh, we're, we're not participating in the breadth of its bounty, but also we're not participating in, in the very nature of how systems work. Uh, so diversification of demand, I think, is incredibly important. Uh, but also, you know, just quite simply, eat a lot more vegetables. Uh, you know, that's, you know, I'm sorry to tell you, your mother was right on this one, but if you want to be healthy, if you want to be sustainable, that's the first step. Uh, but also I think that there is uh, you know, a real sense of, that chefs have the, the power to uh, inform guests about that object impermanence. You know, when we were young children, we learned the idea of object permanence, that you know, if, if I take this hat off and put it behind my back, well, it still exists. But in America especially, uh, 
I can tell you that orange roughy is depleted. It's going away. It's in danger. What are you talking about? It's in the refrigerator case right there. And chefs are really, I think, in a unique position to communicate that, uh, not just by saying this is endangered, but here's a fabulous solution, an alternative. And so this is not just about sacrifice. It's about introducing new opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's, that's really where education uh, becomes relevant to people because they're able to emotionally absorb it. You know, if you tune them out by, by starting a conversation about guilt, people aren't willing to truly listen and to hear. But if you're, if you're talking about entertainment and opportunity, then people are really alongside you participating and they're, they're emotionally engaged with the topic. Well, this, the world is one ocean and uh, we, it's mostly covering our planet right now. So we definitely need to do a better job of, of what we do and what we put on our plates and how we connect and uh, not just here in the US, but globally. And I think that's what's, what's really great in the work you're doing with the index and the work you're doing, Barton, on <coughs> um, the seafood and sustainable seafood front. So thank you so much for joining me today in studio and also to Fabian and Joe, Dr. Joe Pollack down in Aquarius. To, it's so exciting to, to talk with them live and, and meet with Mission 31 and, and talk about the importance of protecting our world's oceans. So that's it for this episode of Capitol Hill Ocean Talk. But tune back in at 2.30 for our final studio broad broadcast from Chow 2014. We're going to feature her deepness, Sylvia Earle, who eats more vegetables, right here on OceansLive.org. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you then.